you might only meet one one dude dumb enough to turn down an offer from Cody Jones to join Dude Perfect. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Wiffle ball is an extreme passion of mine. I, I don't know if I'm Norp levels. <laughs> this guy is a prodigy. A uh, fun little secret is. Everybody, before we get into today's episode, I want to say welcome to the new home of the Pipe It Up podcast. We are super excited about this new space, and we're going to film some incredible interviews down here throughout the 2023 season, and uh, a great way to kick it off today. I'm sure you guys saw the title and the thumbnail, Sparky from Dude Perfect's coming on the show, and it was so cool chatting with him, just learning about the ins and outs of Dude Perfect and what an empire that has become. So without further ado, this is the Pipe It Up Podcast. Cue the intro. All right, showtime, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, we are proud to welcome onto the show Kevin Sparkman, a.k.a. Sparky from Dude Perfect, as you guys probably all know him. Yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, Sparky, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate y'all uh, having me on. It's a joy. It's our pleasure. It really is our pleasure, especially as longtime fans of Dude Perfect and what you guys have built and just seeing your story these last few years and kind of your come up and rise on the channel has been, been pretty special to watch as, as an outsider, so... I think what, what we're all curious about here sitting in this room, me, Jack, and Kyle, is kind of your story from when you were real young up until where you're at now in your career. So that's kind of what we want to get into today with you. Beautiful. Yeah. So uh, the connection to Dude Perfect is uh, not as complicated as one would think. My best friend from high school, I went to a small Texas high school, 3A school. We had about 80 or so people in our grade called Whitesboro High School, uh, country boy. But my best friend growing up named Travis Labhart. Uh, practically a brother of mine, spent the night at his house many a nights, including including uh, school nights. The mom would let it pass because he was so trusted. Great family. Practically grew up with the kid. He went down to uh, Texas A&M to play football, actually walked on. Uh, he was there during the Manziel days. If you remember, a little 1-5, a little slot, slot receiver named Travis Labhart. I was the best friend growing up. Well, we knew of Ty from high school because we were in the same district. Ty was QB and over at a nearby uh, high school called Prosper. And so we knew of him, didn't like him too much because he lit us up for about 250 and a couple tutties. <laughs> but um, we knew of him. Uh, so my boy goes down to CSTAT, and at A&M, him and Ty hit it off. Next thing you know, they're roommates his sophomore year. Well, I was, uh, I'm one of the few, actually, like one of the only ones here at the office who didn't go to Texas A&M. I'm a University of North Texas product, but uh, I was frequently visiting down there in College Station. And... Um, yeah, just really mutual friends hit it off with Ty really well. Um, and so that's kind of how, that was backyard edition days. That's when they were first getting started at the old house. And it's funny because we actually visited Monday down there in College Station to do a little video shoot. And uh, yeah, it was full circle. I know it was very full circle for them, but we even visited the old house and whatnot. But yeah, the connection is my best friend growing up ended up being really good friends with Ty. I actually was silly enough to turn down a gig years ago up here. So wow. I was a radio, television, film major at the University of North Texas, and I, uh -huh. I am sports through and through. It's my heartbeat, man. I, I really don't know what I'd do without sports. I watch more live sports than anybody you could imagine. Mid-major basketball, yeah, give me Presbyterian versus Merrimack, you know. I'm that <laughs> kind of guy. I dive in. I dive in big time. So I really was uh, doing well in the sports radio business when I first graduated college. Got an internship in Dallas. Of course, Dallas is a huge market for sports. Um, so I really wanted to, to shoot my shot there at the radio station. And so I gave it a couple of years, was getting some air time. And then uh, Cody Jones came back to me uh, years later and was like, hey, man, are we going to do this or not? And I, was, I made the mistake first time around. I said, let's do it, boys. So, uh, yeah, just some mutual friends. And uh, over the years, just kind of it worked itself out and ended up sitting here today. So, Well, that's awesome. Um, and, yeah, I was familiar you went to North Texas and that you had that broadcasting background. I found you on LinkedIn, believe it or not, and, and did a little research. Oh, man, there. I hadn't updated that page in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all know what you're up to right now, so you don't need to update anything as of, as of right now. But I was curious. Yeah, you mentioned how you're working at CBS, and I think you worked for the school, too, doing some local stuff. Yeah. So that is where you were kind of gearing your future towards, was that traditional sports media? Totally, man. I, I actually wanted to do play-by-play -play originally. I uh, was lucky enough there at North Texas. They have an incredible RTVF program. That's why I went to North Texas. A lot of famous alums come out of that program uh, in sports. Mavs play-by-play -play guy, uh, Mark Folliwell among many others. Um, yeah, so I wanted to do play-by-play, -play, kind of uh, parlayed that into sports radio, but, man, that is my joy is, is to sit and talk sports. Totally. That's awesome. 
So being a sports fan, and and uh, I imagine you also probably had some influences from people that you watch broadcast or you know commentate sports. What were some of those influences for you that made you kind of want to get into that space? That's actually a great question. Um, Mark Folliwell being one of those guys, uh, he was, uh, as, a, as a UNT grad, our sports broadcasting class, uh, half the lectures were bringing back famous alums to talk in front of the class, and I, I've got a shot. Hank Dickinson, if you're watching, that's a, my sports broadcast professor. He's reached out to me about possibly coming in and, and giving a little speech to rally the troops next year. I hope I get to do it. But, yeah, Mark Folliwell is one of them. Um, Eric Nadell, who's the radio play-by-play for the Texas Rangers, longtime radio play-by-play guy, uh, he's up there. Those are kind of, yeah, those would be the, uh, the inspirations, those, those two, really. So even further back from that, so you always were interested in sports, you said, through and through as a kid. Yeah. Did you always want to do the broadcasting side, or were you, did you want to be an athlete? Yeah, dude, totally. I mean, the dream was, of course, playing for Coach K at Duke, you know, playing a little <laughs> Love Unfortunately, it. God made me five five nine. I've got a shot. Uh, I can't defend in the half court though, and uh, it's hard to get that jump shot over six tenors, you know. So it wasn't it was never meant to be. I actually, tried walking on twice at North Texas there my freshman and sophomore year. Came dangerously close my sophomore year to land in land in a little reserve role where I wouldn't see a minute all year, but I still would have been <laughs> part of the team. Uh, and just fell short. And I'm pretty sure it's my inability to uh, guard on the defensive end. Mm. <laughs> That's what did me in. I got gotcha. you. So then transitioning, you know, realizing you're my height, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, whatever. I'm 5'9 on a good day, so we'll, we'll pretend I'm 5'9". But um, when the focus shifted to broadcasting, um, like what sort of steps are you taking to try to make that happen? Because I know it's like, did you have the support of your family and friends? I know it's kind of a tough industry to break through, especially on a major network like ESPN, CBS, those kind of things. So what obstacles did you see for yourself and what were you doing to try to be successful? Yeah. Good question again. Um, yeah, it's a daunting profession given the fact that if you do get into play-by-play, generally you're heading off to do sod poodle minor league games or, you know, who knows, Idaho calling some minor league baseball and whatnot. And I came dangerously close to doing some of those things, but just just never really pulled the trigger. Um, I was just going to say, during your college years too and early professional years, how big of a fan were you of YouTube and other creators um, – you know, eventually not knowing, you know, that you'd be part of Dude Perfect, but just a fan of, of creators and, and YouTube specifically during your college years. Yeah, man. So I actually am a heroic story of a kid who grew when I said when I say country Texas, I'm talking middle of nowhere, Texas. So I quite literally didn't have Wi-Fi growing up. <laughs> um, so, dude, when I hit college there in Denton, Texas, it was a whole new world to me, man. I, I had dial up at the crib. So going to college, I was like, Wi-Fi, what? YouTube, what? So yeah, many a nights were spent just uh, indulging in, in some, some content. Uh, love YouTube. The Dude Perfect guys were kind of my, my original, just, just knowing them personally, were kind of the original late night scapegoat on YouTube. Right. But yeah, man, um, really cool actually to see now we're in 2023 and all this stuff's above my head, but it's really cool to see uh, how many people are, are finding their footing in the entertainment business. I don't think I was ever, I definitely don't have a face for entertainment, but uh <laughs> It's been fun to, it's been really fun to uh, be immersed in this, in this world. So you were working for some local networks while you were in college. Was there kind of a clear path that you had in your mind ahead as like where you thought your career was going to go at that time? No, truthfully, that's really hard on any, any college kid, man. When you're 22 to, you know, 21, 22, and they're like, Hey, you need to definitively know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. That's really hard. So I was calling audibles at the line of scrimmage one day. I was going to the RTBF building thinking, Hey, maybe I should ump. Maybe I should get behind the dish and call balls and strikes. You know, you second guess yourself a lot. I wanted to coach a lot as a passion of mine. Maybe go into that field one day down the line when, when dude perfect's, uh, done for. So, um, yeah, I, 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 uh, there was a lot of second guessing, um, and I definitely did not figure up I'd, I'd end up here, but it's truly been a blessing. You did something right. I mean, I did something <laughs> right, man. Well, you talked about how, and I don't know if there's any regret there actually or not, but so it sounds like you didn't come around to do perfect until your second offer from them. Is that correct? Yeah. So the first offer was more of like, uh, Hey, would you be interested in this? And it was more like, uh, Hey, let me, uh, you know, I got I got count leverage here at the radio station. Let me see if I can hit a bomb first. But no, I flew out to center <laughs> and quickly uh, okay. came calling. Yeah, that happens. So if you don't mind me asking about what year was that? Because I know the first time I saw you actually on the channel was 2020. 
top of 2020. So when was that first job offer? Uh, that would have been back in about 2016, 2017. I was uh, frequently coming up here for morning pickup runs. Basketball, I've, I've stayed friends with the guys for many of years. But yeah, it was uh, 2020 was the year. And thank goodness, man, I, I lucked out. I joined this squad a month before the COVID outbreak. Just played it, mm -hmm. like, played it like a fiddle, man. Um, but yeah, first time around was like 2016, 2017. And I was, I mean, you, you might only meet one, one dude dumb enough to turn down an offer from Cody Jones to join dude. Perfect. That was me. That was me back in about 2017. You still ended up there regardless. I mean, that's, it was, it was meant to be, I think. It's an incredible path, but we got here. So, uh, Spark, I mean, that first video comes around then where you're actually appearing on screen. What are the nerves like? What's the excitement level like there? Because I mean, that's, that's gotta be a, a crazy feeling, you know, jumping into an audience of, you know, 50 million subs. Totally. I, I still can't believe the amount of trust the boys had in me. So the, about a month into the gig, we uh, just decided to, you know, of course, sports were off the screen with COVID going on the outbreak. And so the guys had a phenomenal idea. Let's do like a little quarantine classic. Let's go five nights live of sports this week. Sparky, you host. And that was just like, a, <laughs> you know, like me, Sparky, you know? Yeah, sure. I'll do it. Uh, Getting immersed that way was actually beautiful, though. That made me get my feet wet. But I'll tell you, you, you speak of nerves. I, I do not consider myself really a nervous person whatsoever. Pretty confident young man. I say young. I'm hitting my mid-30s now, boys. It's, I'm getting a little worried. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, dude, there's totally different, though. Being in the radio world, I was on air a lot. When that red light comes on at the radio, you know, there's always that little, like, all right, go time. Mm -hmm completely different when you're just staring into a screen that actually took some time to get normalized to that just looking at camera delivering on camera that was actually one of the biggest hurdles just because i never really did anything on camera it was always just behind a mic mm, right interesting right. yeah I, I watched the quarantine live streams back and i knew that was pretty early on because i think the first time i saw you on the channel was like a month prior in that airsoft battle that was an actual youtube video yeah, and then not man, what a month later up. was the quarantine thing. Yeah, that was a clutch up. That was up. a clutch up. That what was a, an absolute clutch up. What a main character moment in your first appearance. I'll tell you what, man. I just got a, a thrill for the moment, I guess you could say. I, that's that's playing late night Call of Duty, late night Halo. You run out of <laughs> ammo, you know to press Y and switch. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was, I was trained for that moment. I was prepared for that moment, boys. We actually have a, a fun little secret is I, we're doing another Airsoft this year. And, um, Ooh. This one's going to be fun. I hope I get to be a part of it, but uh, I think we've got in touch with Tyler is pretty deep into the uh, the the armed forces world. You know, he's that guy who would love to go through basic just to go through basic, just wired differently. You know, mm -hmm. that's Tyler. But he's got some boys, you know, that are uh, pretty high up there in the military ranks. Well, they uh, are I think are going to come and try to swoop a, a balloon hostage uh, like a little five E five maybe. And that's um, awesome. Well, I told Ty, I was like, dude, we better get some, we better get some killer B roll because that is going to be a short video. He's like, you don't think we got a chance? I'm like, no brother. I love your, I love your competitive spirit and no chance. That's going to be a short vid. Hopefully Alcatraz though is where we're hoping to film that. It'd be sick. Oh, wow. That would be so that's cool. Insane. So, um, I got a question. So when you, you know, got that second opportunity to work with dude perfect and, you know, decided to do so, what was the, what was the sort of the reaction from your family and friends? Like, were they very supportive of you kind of walking away from what you were working on at the time to do so? I mean, you know, you described your background and not having like Wi-Fi. I'd have to imagine that like for your family, it was pretty, uh, you know, it's different. You saying like, I'm going to go work for this company that's doing, you know, this stuff on YouTube. So what, totally. what was that kind of like? Yeah, man, that was, uh, that definitely the support system. It has been great. Uh, when I go back home, it's a small town. So they, they love me there. They love me back home. Everybody sparkies me. Uh, I actually don't think many people know the first name Kevin back home, teachers, coaches, parents it was just sparky through and through but no everybody's pretty proud man i'll be honest though it, no real rhyme or reason it's just kind of uh put myself in a good spot it chose some really good friends i think the people you hang around genuinely i really do think the people you hang around are uh, some of the most important people in your life close friends and um they really laid the foundation and i'm glad they uh saw a fit for me in the company where i could succeed and help build the brand and yeah, man, it's been a whirlwind. I, I am still used to like going out to the store or going to DFW airport and getting recognized. 
that that's a little weird for me still. I'm not I'm not accustomed <laughs> to that. They've been they've been a dozen years deep in that. They know how to they know how to roll. But uh, for me, that's still sometimes it's like, uh, oh yeah, I kind of forget, you know. Well, it seems like the dudes might have had a more clear vision for you at the company than you did yourself because you talked about how it was you were caught off guard when you were asked to host that quarantine classic. So, like, what did you anticipate your evolution looking like at the company versus what actually happened? How did that differ? Um, so, really, the the main reason I was brought on was the guys really wanted to do a gaming channel for the longest time, and again, surreal going from mm-hmm. dial up to maybe you know, doing some gaming for Dude Perfect makes no sense. The math doesn't add up at all. Um, but yeah, the, the original plan was for me to come in and game, maybe do some judging in overtime. And actually what happened was we had a historic uh, freeze here in Texas last year, you may remember. It was like five straight days under 32, and that's like DFW completely stops if there's, you know, even a hint of sleet or snow on the ground. And everything was shutting down, the grid was going off, and what happened was we... Uh, we were done with work for the week. We canceled it after Wednesday. Well, Ty comes up here on a Sunday to the office. The next door neighbors are a tile company. Their pipes burst, man. Ty walks into about an inch of water on the floor, uh, wiped out the whole left side of the office, including the gaming room. Uh, would have cost a lot to rebuild. Thank goodness it didn't hit the production side, you know, the gaming room, uh, albeit there was a ton of cash poured into that. Uh, at least it wasn't the editor bay and, and whatnot. So we actually kind of got a little lucky that Ty came up here on that Sunday or the whole office would have got flooded. But at that moment, instead of pouring money back into the gaming channel, uh, my role kind of switched up at that moment. I think I kind of built up some trust with the guys, camera time, and, and we just kind of parlayed from there. So really, uh, not really the most uh, organic way to get to where I am is like a de facto fifth and a fifth and a half guy, I guess you could say. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, maybe the best winter freeze of all time. Now, granted, I love, I love gaming. Don't get me wrong. I love gaming, but uh, it's been a joy to kind of transition to this part of it. And, you know, sometimes in the past, maybe get left out on a trip because I was back home gaming and, you know, now I'm just rolling with the boys 24 seven tour, all that. So it's, it's a joy. Sweet. I want to segue to the uh, the tour life, Sparky. Um, we yeah, always man. say with MLW, with just the amount of public tournaments we run, we think it's so cool how we can actually meet our audience, engage with them, yeah, you know, see, see 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 our viewers, and put a, a face to a name. So just talk about how rewarding that is for you and all the dudes, um, while at the same time, I'm sure being very taxing on you guys, um, just you know executing that entire tour every year. I love the guys to death. I love these dudes to death. But come tour time, I mean. I'm ready to land a right hook on Cody Jones' <laughs> jawline. It's a lot of dude time, man. First and foremost, it's two months with those boys, and uh, the lavish lifestyle you think of a tour bus would be, it's not, man. I am a picky sleeper. I have to have my travel <laughs> fan. I have to have a fan up in my grill every night. And uh, I, I don't sleep on planes, so I was having a really hard time sleeping on the bus. But, I mean, you're in a little coffin, all six of us. Brutal sleep schedule. Um but but with the interacting with the fans, that's probably the most humbling part, man. You, you sometimes you get uh, you, you're in the office. We'll have some fans come by each day by the front front door. But when you go to one of these tour shows, man, and you go to these meet and greets, and these kids are just absolutely losing it. I think it really puts it in perspective. You know, one how good I have it too. Just just how fun it is to to make somebody else's day. And man, seeing those kids just light up when they see the five guys. Nothing beats it. Nothing beats it. And walking out on the stage in front of about 15K, that that was new to me too, man. But uh, yeah, dude, you, you want to talk about your heart getting going. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine, man. That's insane. That is a huge stage. Yeah. So who's the, who's the easiest in the crew to travel with and who's the hardest? Who? Um, that's a great question. Garrett's probably the hardest to travel with. Love G to death, but man, he is just... Once push comes to shove, he, he, he'll start airing his grievances there pretty quick, you know, about a month in. I usually turn from teammate to, like, mediator by the halfway of this point of this tour, boys. I, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. But uh, Garrett, Garrett gets – it's he's a clean freak. You know, he's a very schedule-oriented kind of dude. So when he gets thrown out of whack, I mean, he can go to shambles. But at least he has something. We, the best part about tour is we golf every single morning. I think it's the only thing that keeps us sane. But each tour stop – We'll, uh, we'll hit a pretty prestigious course. And I'm an avid golfer, so are the boys. That, that really does keep us sane. Uh, but Garrett at least has a nice excuse when he's yanking seven irons, you know. <laughs> OB, he's like, oh, I didn't sleep well, you know. Um, the, be- the easiest is probably Ty. 
Okay. Uh, Ty is just – that guy is incredible. Let me tell you about Ty. He um, – as high energy as they come, and he puts me to shame. I'm a high energy guy, but like we generally start each morning with like a 9 a.m. meeting here at the office. Dude, it'll be 9.15, and this guy is bouncing off the walls. And I'm just like, hey, man, if we could get to 10.30, you know, till we, till we started yelling, that'd be great. But Ty, if we didn't have Ty, I, I call him QB1, man. Uh, on tour, he is he's the engine that goes, man. I don't know where he gets the energy. He'll go out and fire 75 at Firestone and then go have a heck of a pre-show and go kill the show too, man. He, he's a he's a magician. He really is. Best performer I know, Ty Tony. I think that's a big reason why Dude Perfect as a whole has seen a lot of success is all of you guys. Everyone that's a part of it seems to always bring the best, most positive energy. I've never seen any negative. I'm sure it happens off camera, but oh, yeah, you guys present yourself so well. And it is incredible thinking about, you know, hearing it. And we've had our long travel days too doesn't compare to yours i'm sure but even having energy to just to golf in the morning is yeah. incredible to me too because i know how long those days have to be with the the tour and the rehearsal and the show itself i'm sure it's super hectic so um, it's, it's cool to hear about um how the guys are off camera as well i think yeah yeah like along those lines though i i feel like another reason you guys work so well together is that each person kind of brings a little bit different energy to the table or you know contributes something a little bit different and you've sort of been in a spot where you have worn a lot of different hats for dude. Perfect. You know, you've done a lot of different things for them. Is that something that you're comfortable with or excites you? Or is it sort of, you know, you'd rather kind of just stick in one lane and get really good at that one thing? No, I love That's one of my favorite parts, man. I actually, in high school baseball, growing up my sophomore year, man, I was the utility guy, you know, one day starting <laughs> left next district game, play two bag. Uh, maybe DH. So I I love bouncing around. I love that. Really, it's just the guy's trust in me has been phenomenal. I, I sometimes I'm I'm like, man, why you're putting way too much? You're giving me way too much stage time, boys. You know, I'm liable to pop something off. But uh, but no, yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's it's a weird dynamic. But you're exactly right. Hit it on the head with it. It all works. I think because we all are vastly different. You know, I'm I'm head honcho trash talker. I feed off of it. And then you got two dudes like the twins who I love to death, but genuinely the nicest friends I have. You know, I'm firing away at Corey, right. and he's incapable of firing back. And I'm working with him. You know, <laughs> I'm like, come on, man, just say something bad about me. Say something bad about me, Corey. You can do it. Uh, but yeah, it actually does work really well. And, and I mean, dude, anytime you work with, you know, uh, five of your closest friends for as long as they have, it's a testament to uh, just how professional they are, too. Because there's some days, you know, you just go, you go home for the weekend, and it's like I don't want to see the twins, I don't want to see Cody, I don't want to see them for two days. I need, I need all the two days I can get here. So uh, yeah, we, I mean, we do rub knuckles from time to time, but um, I think we also are very accountable. We keep each other accountable, and you know, if if, if something needs to be said, somebody will say it to you, in in the nicest way possible. But maybe you know they get their point across. But yeah, accountability's a big part of it. The success, I would say, too. Speaking of professionals, uh, you had the opportunity to work alongside Doris Burke in one of the videos. Uh, what was that like for you? Yeah, Doris was, speaking of professional, as professional as they get. I That was like the first celeb I worked with, you know, because um, COVID happened when I first joined the team. So we weren't interacting a ton with the outside world or any other fellow athletes or celebrities. And so that one was, that was bucket list for me, man. I had a hard time kind of separating like, oh my gosh, being wide-eyed and, and keeping it real. But Doris hit me with a side hug in the first about 30 seconds of meeting. And uh, from then on, we just flowed. I, I still text her from time to time. Uh, we've built a little relationship there. And she's, uh, she's as good as advertised. I mean, she did, when that camera comes on, she just flips it. And her way of using words is, is so good. She was awesome. She was awesome. No doubt top three for me. Um, high profile person that we've worked with, bar none. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you what your favorite videos to be a, be a part of were, and I'm sure that was up there, but are there others that come to your mind that are really in that top three of just videos entirely where maybe you had a big say in the, in the video and how it went or just, um, you know, actually performing the video? What are those top three for you if you could, if you could think of them? Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Airsoft 2, of course, that was mm -hmm. just like, hey, man, I peaked early. One video in, <laughs> yep. that was, yep. I, hit, I, hit the, I hit the echelon. Um, 
other than that, getting to work with um, John Roms, one of my favorites, down really down to earth dude. I watched him fire fifty nine for Ty's birthday. We went and golfed at uh, his oh ranch down God. in South Texas, and it was the most casual so fifty nine of all. It was it was dumb. It was so dumb to it's watch. Easy. It. It's actually a little depressing. Yeah, he made it look like a putt putt course. I think he <laughs> he's one putted. It's closer to what I shoot, about ninety five. <laughs> right, right. He one putted sixteen times. It was it was crazy. But John, oh John God. is as, as advertised. He's a real dude. Uh, other than that, with Dak Prescott came for our Thursday night football with um, mm-hmm. Amazon. Dak was uh, man. You want to talk about a leader? I was ready to. Uh, I was ready to run quarterback sweep right and be his lead blocker and take on a Mike linebacker because that guy was just authentic. Uh, Dax up there for sure. Um, yeah, I've, I've been lucky enough to meet quite a bit of people. Truth be told, that's that's a uh, that's been that's humbling for sure. Uh, Drew Brees, really cool guy, just to name a few. Texas product. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm biased. You know, as Texas boys, yeah. we we, right. we are oh, very yeah. biased. No, no we love our state and we love our we love our people. We know. We've been down from time to time, and uh, the Texas passion is real from all you guys. It's a prideful bunch. If there's a shirt or a hat with the state logo on it, you, you rep it, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, Texas gave us Lions fans probably the thing we've been most proud of in Matthew Stafford. So, we, you know, <laughs> we hold Texas close to our heart as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, was that bittersweet sure. watching Stafford go win one outside of Detroit? You know, we were kind of happy. Honestly, we were, we were happy. proud of him. I, 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 sure. I can say at least that's, that I was a bittersweet kind of thing going that's on. That's how down bad the Detroit Lions <laughs> fan base is. Is that we didn't even come. We had won four games that year, I think, and it was like we won a Super Bowl and we didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I was at so. the uh, play a home playoff game at AT and T. A huge Cowboy fan. Uh, sorry in advance. I, 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 the fan, the rest of the fan base doesn't represent. At least me. you're from I, Texas. They, they get annoying. Correct. Yeah, I actually despise cow because being a Mavs, Stars, Rangers guy, those are all pretty mid market. So my fandom with the Cowboys is completely different. Being so national, I actually despise it. Um, <laughs> but I was at the playoff game at home where uh, man Anthony Hitchens got away with a PI. So 2014. That, yeah, man, I, I felt a little disgusting about winning that game. I think Demarcus Lawrence had a strip sack there late, and the Cowboys advanced. But I, I felt a little, I felt a little guilty because I think even the ref threw it, called PI, and I, then yeah, picked he did. it up and waved he did. it I off. Think he, I, he picked it up. I think the NFL wanted to see uh, Dallas TV ratings, you know, in the divisional round or something, but it was a little fishy. <laughs> Yeah, I sympathize for y'all being being Lions fans, though. But, I mean, let's be honest. Since I've been alive in 91, I don't have any recollection of the first three Cowboys Super Bowls there in the 90s. So we're pretty much in the same boat, boys. It's bad. I'm in a drought. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, too, a little bit about because you do do so many different things, like you mentioned working for Amazon Thursday Night Football, working with Doris Burke on the more traditional broadcasting side, and even doing things like acting in the stereotypes videos now, like, has that been like a newfound passion for you? Like, would you ever consider maybe getting into acting? Because, I mean, I can tell you, like, you do a good job at it, first of all. You're funny. Wow, appreciate and that, man. Humbling. It's yeah. like, it's just funny to see. Cause I, I know what it's like to try to do stuff like that for even on our stage. And it's not easy. And you do a good job. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm one tier above Matthew McConaughey right there below Leo <laughs> DiCaprio. Somewhere in between there. No, um, actually, I really, that's, that's phenomenal that you asked that because I am... Uh, I've really found some, I've really found some passion in doing the uh, the stereotypes, man. And really, if you can convince yourself mentally to go there, and and act it out, uh, it's pretty easy. But uh, even the guys have been giving me kudos, taps on the back for the acting skills and stereotypes. Stereotypes <laughs> bar bar none, the best to film, because you can rip the thing off four times. Everybody's feeding lines to each other. And, um, yeah, man, it's hard to beat a stereotype. They're pretty laid back, chill, and that's, that's where you really can showcase your, your comedic skills. Sparky, what is it like to witness the rage monster every single stereotype <laughs> video? Dude, what's crazy is Ty couldn't be more opposite of a rage monster when he does get a little upset. So it's a fascinating uh-huh. little thing going on there. He's more of a, a compartmentalizer. He'll be internal yeah. when he's a little upset. Uh, but, yeah, dude, um, those are tough sometimes because you realize how much money we put into some of the rage monsters and it's like oh that hurts but man sometimes i've seen like heavy machinery being used and like all sure cars cars i mean crazy i just recently got a a a new car but i mean one of the get crafties were just where the guys are just ripping up cars this little pt cruiser like a 13 you know 2013 little pt cruiser i'm like cody yeah gosh man yeah i could have drove that you know like (laughs) next time tell me tell me we're doing this you can 
take my 08 Honda out back and I'll take the I'll take the upgrade. I was gonna say there's one moment in particular that I thought was hilarious and like even everybody broke, but there's a blooper featured in the airplane stereotypes one where the one where you farted on the plane and you're like, claim I'll claim the first one, but the second one was not me. That killed me. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't even know where that came from. That was first try at it. And uh, yeah, I caught Ty off guard, man. He lost it. Yeah, it's remarkable how many kids men the potty humor. Of course, the kids love the potty humor. But how many people bring that up when they meet me? Like, that was man, so... Was a, that was a big rip on the plane. That's a, classic yeah, thing you know. you, that's a classic thing you say with your boys. The first one, yeah, it was me. The second one, no. And everyone knows it's not sure. true, but that was it was just funny. Sure. And it was funny, yeah, too, from that. me observing it. And watching that scene back prior to interviewing you today, um, I could kind of tell like all the dude perfect guys broke and started laughing. Where I think more like the actor people were kept, you know, kept a straight face. So I found that to be hilarious because it was genuinely funny. Right? Yeah, we actually have a hard time with Cody Jones because I mean, you you won't even have to say anything funny, and the guy will crack and just start getting the giggles, is what we call it. And he can't he can't perform a stereotype for his life when he gets the giggles. Um, but yeah, man, those are fun. The, the only bad thing about that one, and I know y'all went out to SoFi too. It was really cool. We, we went out to SoFi on that trip as well. But dude, doing airplane stereotypes, you don't think about it. We flew out to Hollywood and then sat on a fake plane for three straight days for about eight hours just to catch a plane ride home. I, I, when I got mm-hmm. back home, I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to fly on an airplane again. I was sick and tired of it. <laughs> So you obviously, you, you've done a lot of different things, like we said, for, for Dude Perfect, and now you guys are on tour, and you know you kind of talked about how like surreal that is for you, but um, when, when you're doing these big shoots or doing one of those events, do you find yourself able, are you able to kind of enjoy that and take it in while it's happening, or are you kind of too focused on like the task at hand and what needs to be done before you can kind of like reflect and, and really, you know realize how cool it is all the stuff you guys are doing yeah if it's like a basic workshop like we're going to vegas next week because ty's going to try to re-break the the world's highest shot that that got broken oh nice. yeah man i'm excited we're going to the top of the strat and he's going to shoot down and we have like eight hours for four days allotted and we're just hopeful that he hits it because there's no guarantee of course with the with the tricky um but on shoots like that you know i can kind of uh just be the the mood guy the vibe collector if you will you know just kind of keep spirits up but when it came to tour man i even let people back home know friends know i was uh, tasked with so much by the guys which i loved i love taking on so much they trusted me to take on a lot during pre-show and on stage and whatnot yeah I, I had to completely um you know get out of the personal life world there for two months because it was just that uh, that big of a commitment that big of a, a workload um it's a great question but no tr- truthfully no like you look back on tour sometimes and in the courses we played and no, i probably didn't enjoy it as much as i should have just because first and foremost you know you're there to it's a business trip you're there to perform you're there to uh, put on a good show for the peeps and so sometimes man i we I, we have like backstage we have a a, a little chalkboard with what city it is because sometimes you get so deep into it man you're about to go out on stage you're like we're in st paul no no no, no. okay we're in cleveland What's up, Cleveland? You know, sometimes you got to get a <laughs> reminder just because you're that fixated on, on doing your thing. Sparky, about your interest in wiffle ball, I want to know what your stat yeah. line would be if you got inserted into an MLW wiffle ball game. What are you going? You getting a hit? Getting a couple hits? Oh, I'm getting a hit. I got great bat, bat to ball skills. I, I hit from the okay, left side. Okay. I throw with my right, but always hit from the left side growing up. I'm more of a top of the order guy. Really, okay. a two hole is a good spot for me because if you want to do a that. little action, you want to do a little hit and run, you want to do a little bunt. I can small ball it up. Never hit for pop. It's the one thing that disgusts me. Of course, my high school field, they, they redid the dimensions. But back when I was in high school, dude, it was like 375 to the dead center, 330 down the lines. Oh, I didn't have a shot, man. Uh, the best <laughs> I could do is put one, put one in the alley. So I never hit a bomb growing up, which is disgusting. I hit the wall and right in a road game once. So funny story. I, I love wiffle ball. Wiffle ball is an extreme passion of mine. When... Um, I was in high school. My high school basketball coach trusted me enough to give me a key to the locker room to go to the gym during the summer whenever I wanted to put up shots to, before going into the senior year. Well, in Whitesboro, Texas, once it hits about 10 p.m., and nothing open. There's two stoplights going, and um, there's no action going on. So what we did was we had a group of boys, very much like y'all, kind of out of the dirt, created this little wiffle ball league. 
And uh, I would use my key at about 1.30 a.m. there in Whitesboro. We'd go through the locker room, and we'd have full-on, four-on-four uh, wiffle, ga- wiffle games in the gym that whole summer, man. I mean, I was dealing. Oh, that's How many awesome. quality starts I that had that awesome. summer was insane. <laughs> no, I'd have, I I'd have a pretty good slash now. line. Yeah, I might have to, man. I, I don't know if I'm NORP levels. I don't know <laughs> if I'm, I'm a five-tool guy like NORP because, I mean, I mean, let's be honest, NORP does it all, man. He, he's got a golden glove. The guy's an ace on the mound, hits for pop, got some speed. That guy's I don't think a prodigy. I'm NORP. He is. He's, he's pretty good, man, my favorite ball player. But uh, I could definitely, I, I could be a winning piece to a, a winning team, a winning club, no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. I think we need to see it happen. I think you could be a great two hitter to get you a, a couple knocks a game, get yourself on position for, for Norp to hit you in. I think that I think that's where the way Spark would play the game. Sure. And I could roam that outfield, too. I could roam that outfield, bringing stuff back for sure. Oh, well, hey, we're, we're working on coming back to Texas this winter. And if we're back there and you're free, man, might put yeah, your money where your mouth is out. and come out and get sure. yourself on a roster for the tournament. As long, <laughs> hey, as long as whoever on the mound doesn't get upset when I flip it, you know, <laughs> have a, a Bautista size flip going on. I'm going to admire my bomb. I don't have many in my life. So the ones I do hit, I'm going to have to peek at it. We had we had some pretty disrespectful bat flips this past season. Would you be would you be a respectful bat flipper or would it be pretty egregious see uh, a respectful bat flipper guy because i do i i am a guy who's old school in the sense that i still love some of those unwritten rules you know i'm like right in the middle man like i love seeing a good bat flip but i also like seeing a guy go 98 up by his you know back (laughs) for doing it too you know i just love that aspect of baseball so yeah i'd probably i'd probably pimp it but I'd, I'd, i'd be expecting a cutter up and in (laughs) <laughs> Next at bat, that's part of it, you know? No doubt. Yeah, Absolutely. For sure. So um, switching gears back to Do Perfect a little bit, I wanted to ask you too, because it seems like there's a lot of trust in you from from the guys and in the decision making and stuff like that. So is there any like particular idea or concept that you can think of that you contributed to a video at some point that you're most proud of? Wow. That's a phenomenal question. Actually, the creative meetings are so fun here. Sometimes we'll get distracted for 30 minutes, but we, we gener- generally sit down for about two hours every two weeks or so on a Monday morning and go through creative ideas. That's a lot of fun because there's really no bad ideas, and we'll just you know use each other as ideas and throw out some of the most outlandish video ideas that don't work. Uh, I don't know if I can if I can be credited to a, a whole video myself, but I've definitely, uh, I've, and what's fun is in the last couple of years, for sure, in those team meetings, I feel like my, my uh, take on things, my opinion is, is held in a little higher regard, which is fun. But yeah, I throw my two cents in. I'm not, I'm not scared to, you know, mix the pot up and say, hey, you know, maybe we should go this way or, or that way. But really, it's Ty. Ty is the uh, engine behind the creative ideas. That guy will take nothing and then all of a sudden come up with squall battle that we just did. <laughs> he's yeah, yeah he's I incredible it. man were there any uh ideas thrown around in any of those meetings that were you know cool but you guys just weren't able to make happen Ooh, let me think here man it's it's i mean it's nice throwing that dp around to, with our brand ambassador because we we do get a lot of stuff done i think yeah. the uh playing all sports golf battle being with the boys at augusta I mean, once you do that, it's like, it's like, hey, you're giving us too much. You know, not many people yeah. say you got too, too big of a leash, but I think you need to tone us down a little bit. Uh, I'm trying to think of something that didn't end up happening. Uh, we had a betcha, actually, we were going to do as part of an overtime with Clayton Kershaw, who's uh, a DFW boy. Uh, he went to Highland Park here in Dallas, and uh, he still lives in the DFW. Uh, but... I think it was last spring training. We were trying to get him to throw an AB to each of the five guys and see if they could make contact. And unfortunately, I think uh, I can't remember if he was coming off injury or something happened where he wasn't revved up to the point they felt, uh, you know, comfortable enough with with health not being a problem. And so that got scratched. But I would love, and I'm a left hander, of course, like I said. So I have no chance left on left with Kershaw. But man, I'd love to sit in the box and uh, and see what I could do at least, you know. For sure. For sure. That'd be awesome. Um, so I wanted to ask you too, because you talked about, you know, where you started and the future a little bit more. So you're with Dude Perfect now. I can just kind of tell that you're, you're pretty happy with your, your current career and the decision you made yeah. to make that switch. And it seems like you're enjoying yourself. But do you have like a clear vision for your future at the moment? Do you want to ride with Dude Perfect as long as you can? Or do you want to dip back, in, back into that traditional sports world? 
Great question. Yeah. Um, obviously, no, that is, this is probably not something that lives on forever. I think five to 10 years is, is honestly a pretty, pretty good gauge of maybe what we got, got left in the tank here before we transition. Luckily, the guys are extremely smart in the fact that they've got, uh, a, you know, a lot of resources and finances tied up in different areas. You know, they've really mm -hmm. is, have used the brand as leverage in the last couple of years to, you know, make money outside of YouTube and whatnot. I don't know exactly where I go with that, but luckily, obviously, given the connections I, I've, I have and, and am going to have, um, I would love to get back in the sports world, whether that would be like, you know, some kind of front office. I'm, I'm addicted to that stuff too. I hop on the show and just run a franchise and, and remake the Pittsburgh Pirates in one night just for the heck of it, you know, because I, I love it. Love I love that. it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, last night, boys, I was playing Diamond Dynasty. And uh, got a good club. I've got a good club. I, I'm a little right-handed heavy, but last night I played Jonah Bride, the backup catcher for the A's on Diamond Dynasty, and he had his real card in there. So I'm like, oh, man, I'm playing this guy. Absolutely smoked me. But it was really <laughs> cool. It was like it was like 13 to 2 in the fourth, and I don't get beat that bad. I mean, I'm, a pretty good, I'm a pretty good little player, but I had Luis Castillo going, and he was teeing off. And, um, <laughs> but it was really cool, actually, to like see how he was calling a game with DeGrom, he had DeGrom on the mound, but I was really fascinated by a big league catcher calling pitches on the show, you know? I was just kind of trying, oh, yeah. trying to feel what he was thinking there. He diced me. I mean, slider away, fastball on the hands. I had no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all played the show? Y'all oh, played the show awesome. at all? Not a little a bit, a little bit. We do. You know who plays the show is Norp. You should square we up We got with a him. lot of guys in the league oh, we that gotta take set it that very up. seriously. Maybe, yeah, yeah, or some ranked duos or something. Tell them to get some packs <laughs> yeah. on that a Diamond Dynasty. Sweet. I can't I can't go out there with Norp and him be a liability, though. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need him to carry his weights, the thing, you know? <laughs> that kid, I think, is good at everything he does. From what I've heard, he's pretty okay. solid. And Brendan's nodding his head. I think he's pretty <laughs> solid at the show. <laughs> okay, okay. Norp can be trusted. All right. Yes. Yeah, we'll have to exchange gamer tags. It's been so cool tracking your journey, even from the beginning of 2010, 11, 12, um, especially. And you can tell Corey this. I read his book called Go Big, and that actually really yeah. inspired me to uh, to um, actually make MLW into a business. So I read that four years ago, Sick, very dude. shortly after, you know, went all in on our dream of MLW. And then a couple of years later, you know, we're traveling to SoFi Stadium to, to perform our World Series. So Wow, that's incredible. You read you read the book, man. I, uh, I, I, went, read it, I, yeah. went, I went through all that book. I I. I filled out all the prompts and everything like that. I was like super into it. I mean, I think he wrote that incre incredibly well, even at like, what, 23, 24 years old, maybe something like right out of college. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was early. We were actually talking about that the other day. You know, I was like, man, could you, you know, could you wait it on the novel for a couple more years? We could have a little <laughs> more in that thing. But he he's a go getter, man. Core is uh, once he sets his mind to something, he's he's ripping it off. So uh, that that's really cool, though. You read the book, man. That's awesome. Now I know who to blame because I just thought about this and put two and two together. But I I read that book like two weeks before I quit my office job. So if I, this goes down in flames, I know who to blame. <laughs> <laughs> it's Corey's fault. It's yes. Corey's fault. Yeah. Yes, yeah. They, sure. they did the same. I mean, they I, obviously, as you saw in the book, they all had to take a leap of faith too, yep. um, which of course worked out. And it doesn't work out for everybody. But there were some dark days in there during the startup of Dude Perfect. I can remember when they were really going for it that it was like, you know, we're going to go through with this or not. And uh, it really took pot commitment by every every single one of them to really have that buy-in. And they still to this day talk about talking to their, their uh, father-in-laws, you know. It's like, hey, listen, this is going to come off weird, but we're quitting our jobs to become YouTubers. Uh, stick with me <laughs> here. You know, that's a tough conversation to have with the old father-in-law. Uh, but, yeah, dude, I... I, I I think everything uh, you're successful at in life obviously takes a certain amount of effort. And so I commend y'all for really buying in because, I mean, you go you go lukewarm with it, you go half-hearted with it, doesn't work. You know, you got to be really passionate and, and hardworking about to your product or it's going to go up in flames. Exactly. Now, that's the number one thing I really appreciated from that book was just the, the vulnerability aspect and that light bulb moment or, or um, you know, ultimatum of we really have to go all in or nothing at this on this idea or... I believe a couple of guys had architectural um, design jobs and um, Garrett, they could have yeah, gone just different one. directions and stuff like that. So we, I really related that too with Tommy because Tommy has an engineering background. I could have gone into traditional um, sport marketing, but um, really just in our college years, we, we me and Tommy sat down and we were like, okay, not many people have this opportunity and this, this platform. So we might as well just go all in. And I'm not going to lie. I took a lot I'm of notes from dude, per dude Perfect and um, you know, look where we are a few, a few years later. So it's been crazy. Yeah, it's awesome, man. I was first on y'all's trail, oh gosh, I want to say 
four or five years ago, a little pre dude perfect, but man, the, y'all were my uh, y'all were my late night YouTube fix for the longest time, man. I oh, was thank just you. watching ball games. I was just watching ball game after ball game, especially during COVID. You know, it was like either I can stay up for the KBO at three thirty here and watch the Deuce on Tigers, or yeah. I can watch some <laughs> wiffle ball and get some sleep. So I chose wiffle ball. We got a big jump there in COVID just because we were obviously just playing in our front yeah, yard man. with like our neighborhood squad and stuff like that. It wasn't like a, tr- a huge operation to deal with. So, um, you know, we're, we were we were very thankful that we could have uh, pulled that up in that uh, 2020 yeah. season. Stay afloat. Yeah, during COVID, that was crazy time, man. <clears throat> you mentioned that Norp was your favorite player. Is that where your yeah. allegiance lies with the Diamondbacks? Yeah, man, I'm looking for the third straight. Uh, I want to make this thing a dynasty. <laughs> once you win, Once you win three in a row, it's officially a dynasty. So... No, man, yeah, I, I really just like the, the style Nort plays. You know, he's just a 100, going 100 all the time, man. And, yep. to, and to sweep, to sweep in SoFi, just poetic. He's just got that with dog Nort in him. on the mound. Uh, I, forgive me, I wasn't sure who was swinging there um, on the Cobras, but somebody went chasing on the two-strike pitch there for the World Series. That's not one you want to be in the box for that you want to swing at because, you know, that lives in infamy. That's not just a normal A-B and, you know, you're – first series of the season that that's that's a tough look somebody you know went lightsaber chasing right i think it was drew i think he yeah, chased I, at it that in point, the world series at that point the game was over so it was just it was putting <laughs> sure. the final nail in the coffin we're just but throwing it bats away uh, it was a t- i'm sure i can only imagine how competitive the guys get for you know a single battle video and stuff like that and i mean you, you couldn't imagine how competitive we get for the world series even though it's our little niche thing that's growing slowly but it's the real deal so yeah, it gets it gets pretty competitive, as you can imagine. The Cobras weren't too happy to be getting swept, so I think that last at bat was just the cherry on top. Yeah, what so competitive spirits? Speaking of those, that's the, here at the office, as you probably can see through videos. Tyler Tony, that dude. I'm trying to make him more situationally competitive, is what I call it. It's like, all right, listen, Tyler. You know, if we're having a little get together at your house and your kids are playing and we're playing Twister. <laughs> and I get right hand on red. You don't have to kick. You don't have to kick my arm out, buddy. You know it's it's not that competitive. Situational competitiveness. But no, we got like a pickleball court here, in daily. Uh, I won't say how much, but there's some wager games that go on. You know, and it is high energy. We play two on two, but Ty's looking for anyone and everyone. He'll grab the social media guy just to baptize him in a pickleball game to make himself feel good. You know, love that. We're we're, we're as competitive as they get, though. I kind of wanted to pick your brain just a little bit more. Um, One final question to kind of conclude this. Um, Just with our platform and our audience, and as the following continues to grow, I always just try to be as good of a mentor as I can be to the kids that follow us and the adults too. And um, I think I can kind of tell that you're the same way and someone who seeks mentors and tries to be a good mentor as well. So with you being in your position and, and finding success in YouTube, you mentioned the connections and how important that was, but what do you think you could name one or two tools that have really helped you succeed and to get to where you're at? What do you think those would be? What's been like your, your secret to success, your secret sauce? Great question. Great question. Me, man, I'm a guy who, uh, for some reason, the guys find me to be exotically funny. And I, 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 I'll take it. But uh, any, anywhere I can throw any kind of comedy, you know, into the the operation i feel like that's just good to get people to laugh i i I think laugh is just laughter is one of the biggest things in life man if you're having fun and you're laughing generally that shows on camera as well so keeping a keeping a good spirit about us but uh that's that's actually a really good question i've been laughing on this Um, podcast i know that for a fact (laughs) yeah i like you said that that's very unique that's a unique thing to say but i mean you're right who doesn't want to be around someone who brings up the mood and the energy totally totally and when uh, it's kind of after the gaming thing kind of went, it went flooded on us, all pun intended, I just tried to at least make my, my presence known it, to be a valuable as, as I was kind of up in the air there for a minute on what exactly we're going to do. I, I just wanted to, you know, to be someone of value here in the office and, and, you know, being class clown 2009 of Whitesboro High School, that's, that's, a, whole, that's a high honor to hold, you know. You just, they don't just <laughs> hand sure. those out. Those are earned, not given. So uh, I had a rebu- reputation to, to uphold. So no, I dude, I like to keep it loose. Probably too loose sometimes. I'm the guy who crack a crack a fringe joke five minutes before taking the stage that you probably shouldn't make, you know. Uh, but yeah, keeping it loose, keeping it loose in the office is a, is a big key here because I feel like the the more we have just organic flow, the better it it, it appears on on camera. And we don't really like 
don't we don't storybook anything here in terms of um, like battles and whatnot. We play those as is because that's absolutely going to get the best you know out of each each person from an entertainment value. Well, cool. I like that take on it. I wasn't I like expecting it. you to say that, but I think that's like awesome and a unique take on what it, what it can take to be successful. Because, like I said, being in a good mood is everything. So you surround yourself with people who will do that for you. And yeah, I, I kind of coined the vibe collector. I'm the vibe collector around here right now. <laughs> that's what I'm going with. Cool. All right, dude. Well, we really appreciate your time today. I don't want to take up too much yeah, more of it, but um, it's been awesome having you on. And I hope our listeners enjoyed this. And I know a lot of them are big fans of yourself and do perfect over. Many, many years. So getting to sit down with you face to face and talk has been uh, awesome. And once again, I just appreciate your time. Yeah, it was legit, boys. I appreciate y'all uh, having me on. Best of luck to the channel going forward. I know I'll be uh, definitely staying in touch. We'll be thinking and praying about y'all uh, for sure. Y'all are some good dudes. Could tell. Even through a Zoomer, I could tell y'all are pretty good <laughs> dudes. So uh, we might have to link up and uh, I might have to get that AB. Yeah, I'll be ready. When y'all roll through <laughs> Texas, I'll be ready. I'll have that swing down and. And the bat flip, you know, I'll have it in the mirror already you know, working on it, working on the pose. All right, cool. Yeah, well, we'll keep in touch for sure. And if we're ever, when, we're da- when we're back down, I'll say when, because I know we're going to be back in Texas for sure. It Love probably it. will be this Love year. It. So we'll let you know. Yeah. But uh, Sparky, thanks again. And fans, hope you guys enjoyed. Catch you guys next week. My pleasure, boys. Take care. All right, folks, that's a wrap. Thanks again to Sparky for coming on the show. Um, That was super cool of him, and I just appreciate his support of MLW and everything. So hope you guys enjoyed. If you're new to Pipe It Up, we already have 140-some episodes done, audio only on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And now, beginning with this week and forever forward, we're posting a video version of the podcast every Tuesday at 4 p.m., filming it down here, of course. So we're really excited about that, as well as on the MLW channel, spring training's out, opening day this Friday, 4 p.m. So super exciting times, and uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Pipe it up, 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 pipe